I'm going to present basically dual mobility. And I'm going to say it has a, a dual benefit. Um, and basically, I'm going to emphasize that that dual benefit, like, like John emphasized, in that high-risk primary total hip replacement patient, and also definitely in the revision uh, total hip patient. So um, we reviewed this nicely already, uh, dual mobility, uh, implant design, monoblock or modular. Uh, either design is going to increase your jump distance and going to reduce uh, implant impingement. When you look at, um, you know, this is for one company's uh, large head versus dual mobility bearing, looking at the ADM, which is a monoblock type, you can really see that as you go up in uh, cup size, the jump distance really dramatically increases uh, quite significantly. Here on the far right, you see that monoblock dual mobility design giving really enhanced uh, stability. Um, so really what that does for you is it expands your safe zone. I think uh, we've all talked a lot about the safe zone. We debate what the best safe zone is. I don't think we still understand exactly where that safe zone is, but with a dual mobility bearing, if you're not exactly sure the patient is unpredictable, you can expand that safe zone with that same cup size. Uh, this is a paper here that actually looked at that. So basically took a situation where you had a 52 millimeter cup and uh, you have the option then of using a 36 millimeter head or a 42 millimeter modular dual mobility. And then they kept the cup size in the same position with CT modeling and they moved the femoral version. So adjusted the combined anaversion that Dr. Ranawat Sr. talked to us so well and taught us about the importance of combined anaversion. So took that patient in and out of that combined anaversion safe zone. And we can see in this graph on the left is with a large head and then this expansion at every single femoral combined anaversion position, what happens when you put in a 42 millimeter dual mobility. So this paper reports a five to 10 times safe zone expansion for that same 52 millimeter cup size. We can debate now with thinner and thinner polys. There's some companies out there that now have a 40 millimeter um, uh, ball for a 52 millimeter cup. So in the, in the primary setting, uh, that difference is getting less and less as we talk about thinner and thinner polys, but we'll leave that for the discussion later. Um, when do you want to expand the safe zone? And uh, John highlighted that nicely in that uh, 2B type uh, pelvis that he's uh, published on, the highest risk type where really there isn't a safe zone between the sitting, standing, and supine positions. So when you can't really find an overlap for where that patient has a safe zone for a component position, I think that's a good opportunity to expand the zone so you do get um, safety in all, all patient positions. Sorry. Um, so basically, what's the clinical outcomes? Um, just to highlight a couple studies. These are non-randomized studies, but a large cohort in this paper, 249 high-risk total hips. The definition of high risk varies between studies and for different and for surgeons. This was neurogenic disorders, uh, age older than 70, BMI is greater than 30, alcohol abuse, and they found no dislocations in this cohort um, and, and a really high uh, Harris hip score. This is a paper from our institution. So this is actually all of uh, my dad's patients, uh, you know, 3.6 year follow-up, all using that mon monoblock dual mobility design, 151 patients. And you can see uh, what was considered high risk um, in the graph on the uh, table on the right. And then how many of those patients had um, one or more than one risk factors. You can see that the majority of patients had two or more risk factors that we consider to be high risk. And basically a 3.6 year follow-up had one dislocation, which was in fact, was an intraprosthetic uh, dislocation, but I mean, reasonable outcomes, all posterior approach as well. So I just want to transition the discussion a little bit to the revision setting, where I think you really start to see the power of dual mobility. Uh, our options in revision are constraint liners, large head, or dual mobility. Um, this is a study that I did when I was a fellow at Mayo Clinic, basically looking at you know, 355 revision total hips um, and comparing dual mobility in 146 patients to a 40 millimeter large femoral head. So not even 36, but a 40 millimeter large femoral head where there was 209 patients. And the results showed the dislocation rate was 3% with dual mobility and was 10% with a 40 millimeter head. And the revision rate was significantly less in patients uh, who had a dual mobility implant. Now, one of the small confounders, of this is not a randomized trial. There was a higher rate of cup revision in the patients who received a dual mobility implant. So you can say maybe cup position was optimized in that cohort, although we didn't see a difference in the mean cup position on analysis. What's interesting is that the dual mobility group, if you can see in this graph, this table on, on the bottom here, had a much higher percentage of patients who underwent revision for instability. So this is definitely a higher risk cohort to have recurrent instability. And yet, 
uh, this group of dual mobility patients performed better in that regard. And you can see the survivorship free from dislocation in the graph of, uh, above. So this is a systematic review that we performed, basically looking at the literature and looking at primary and revision. And uh, in the literature, the revision, um, the, so the dislocation rate after revision was exactly the same as the Mayo study, it was 3%. Uh, the IPD percent was 1.3. And so basically, um, you know, dual mobility components were effective in minimizing a dislocation compared to historical uh, dislocation rates after revision. And so uh, this is just looking now at a high risk revision cohort. So 228 patients who were recurrent dislocators being revised to a dual mobility uh, bearing and basically found a 2% uh, dislocation. So you're seeing a recurring uh, um, you know, numbers here of around two to 3% for this high risk revision cohort. The alternative, you know, 10 years ago, and maybe even still today for some surgeons was to use a constrained liner. I think this is also up for debate. What is the role of constrained liners today? Uh, this is just a table of a bunch of papers with different types of constrained liners or different constrained liner designs. I'll just highlight though that in the pa two papers where you had longer term follow-up, of course, the outcomes of constrained liners continue to get worse and worse. Um, there's multiple failure modes that we can talk about, but is if you're younger and you need that constrained liner for five, 10 or more years, that revision rate is gonna go up over time. Uh, why is that? Well, this was an article uh, recently which categorized all the different types of failure mode. Anytime you have multiple interfaces and constraints, uh, it's not a good thing. So this just highlights why that maybe that failure rate was so high. When you look at some studies, looking at patients treated with constrained liners for recurrent instability at 10 year follow up, failure rate was 29% for redislocation and overall failure rate was 55% at 10 years. So 50% roughly are failing at 10 years, which is a pretty high rate. And then unfortunately, the, what happens if those constrained liners who fail? So let's this study basically said, okay, the 50% that fail, a constrained liner, let's put another constrained liner back in and hope for the best. Well, unfortunately, uh, about 50, 57% of those required an additional operation, once again, for recurrent instability. These are some of the highest risk and uh, toughest problems that we face, but constrained liners, again, is really not a great solution. And you can see the survivorship really falls off here and is uh, quite disappointing. Uh, Brian Chalmers, who gave a talk to you earlier today, he wrote this paper when he was a resident in Mayo Clinic looking at a small cohort, so there's um, opportunity for further research, of patients who failed the constrained liner and were converted to a dual mobility as a salvage option because they'd already failed the constrained. And, you know, throughout three-year follow-up, but the results in this small cohort were encouraging that 13 out of 14 had basically retained their vision construct and had not re-dislocated at final follow-up, but obviously we need larger numbers to look at this further. Um, this paper, and we can talk about this as well in this abductor insufficient patients and how do we qualify abductor insufficiency, um, you know, complete abductor loss or trochanteric non-union, trochanteric fracture. Uh, but in this patient, they can included all these cohorts. They had a small group of 20 patients. They treated them with dual mobilities and actually they had no dislocations at three year, around three year follow-up. I still think this is a group though of the abductor deficient patient where dual mobilities may not may not cut it and there probably still is a role i think for constrained liners when you have totally deficient abductors uh just to highlight two papers uh, john kind of touched on this before you know i did publish my single surgeon series of um you know first 560 patients in uh, cases in practice and uh conversions and revisions all included and you know there were dual mobility dislocations what's interesting is that uh, the rate of reduction, the rate of IPD on reduction was extremely high, as John highlighted. So all these now, if it happens, are done um, in the uh, operating room under full sedation and fluoroscopy. And then secondly, um, this is the paper uh, that John highlighted, uh, the cobalt and chromium levels, looking at monoblock and modular dual mobility designs. Uh, the modular did have a slightly higher rate of cobalt and chromium, um, but I would say there was no uh, revisions for Alval uh, at final follow-up and I've done uh, modular dual mobilities with two different companies designs and have not had any issues to date uh, with any kind of metal reaction or revision for Alval so far. Um, so just to summarize, I think, you know, dual mobility is an excellent option uh, for this patient who may be high risk for instability in the primary revision setting because you get all the benefits of an expanded safe zone. It's great in these circumstances, possibly in the abductor deficient patient, possibly in the failed constrained liner patient. So it does have a valuable role in your toolkit. IPD is a unique failure mode that we've talked about, particularly on reduction. And I do think that, you know, as John highlighted, you know, each dual mobility design must be assessed 
for safety and metal ion release if it does have a cobalt chrome liner against a titanium shell. Uh, there are uh, now several years of, of data on a couple different modular designs that look safe in regards to revision for Alval, but every new design that is released, there should be, uh, should be approached with some concern if you do have a modular junction between uh, dissimilar metals. So um, that's what I've got and I look forward to discussion. Thank you. Thank you.